It's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate uh, what a great turnout this is. It's uh, uh, I, I've spent most of my career kind of traveling around the state talking about public policy and, and on a variety of topics, and, and uh, uh, you know I've, I've had many a time when I was happy three people were here, so <laughs> this is great. Uh, kind of we're going to keep this in the same theme. Uh, of looking at alternatives to our current electrical energy system and kind of talk a little bit about some of the new technologies that are coming out uh, and what they might mean for you and and where we're at uh, I'm going to focus a little more on Wisconsin and uh, uh, and then we'll we'll touch on a lot of uh, different topics uh, as we go through this but uh, um, I talk here about a new paradigm of electric supply, electricity supply and demand management. And, and the, you know, that might be a little bit of an academic term, but that is where I just came from, right? <laughs> but what that means is I actually think we can reinvent our electrical energy delivery system. Just reinvent it. We don't need this big system you see here portrayed on uh, uh, something that is put out by the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory every year about our energy system. And I'm always humbled by this chart because we do use a lot of energy <laughs> and it's depicted on here. But I think we can start to think about how can we do this better? How can we be more efficient? How can we deliver more clean energy? Uh, and how can we really make it local energy. Um, I, I, I was listening to uh, uh, a podcast a couple of uh, months back and the person talked about artisanal local electrons. Artisanal? Yes. I love it. I thought it was great. So, so let's think about that. Because I come from uh, working at the Department of Ag and I saw that amazing local food movement emerge while I was working in a world of big agriculture. The one thing I want to point out on this slide here is the box way over there on the right, to make sure I get that right, that, re you know, what do they call it, rejected energy, that's waste. That is waste in this system. We've got a lot of opportunity for improvement with that much waste in our system. Uh, and so I say that's the starting point in reinventing the system is that waste. And I'll let you just read this. I won't uh, try to read all of it here. But you know, this was just kind of one year snapshot on what system losses in a big energy system with big base load generation, big transmission, costs. 19 billion for this one year look using uh, federal EIA data. But the part of this that's important to me is the second paragraph where we now have these new technologies and actually Demand response and energy storage aren't that new in the, in the sense that they were technologies developed uh, certainly uh, more than a decade or two ago. But they've been improved and they're changing dramatically. In the last five years, we've seen rapid, rapid change in, in these technologies. And, and then you see more deployment and the price starts to come down. But the thing I like to remind people about the opportunities under distributed energy resources and smart grid technologies is they're existing. We don't need to invent them. Now we can improve them, and I think we should be in a continuous cycle of invention and improvement, but the technologies are there. Now for Wisconsin, I think the starting point here about why things aren't working so well with a system that has a lot of expense and a lot of waste is we don't plan. You know, how do you get there without a map? We're only one of t 10 states that don't have any kind of energy planning at all. 
And so I'm suggesting uh, that this is a starting point for policy change, is we need to think about revisiting this issue. Now there's, there's a, a, a sort of sub part of planning that I'm a little more interested in called integrated distribution planning. And it gets to what Bill was saying, which is really where change is occurring in the energy sector is at the distribution level. So a number of states are now requiring their utilities to do distribution planning. And what that means is you do side-by-side -side comparisons of the status quo system. So should we put in a bunch of new transmission lines? Should we build another big baseload plan? Or should we look at these smaller scale alternatives? And could it be cheaper? And, and, and do a cost-benefit analysis, which is really simple to do. I just, I used, when I was at the university, I worked with graduate students who were in a cost-benefit analysis class. They could do these projects, <laughs> so I know the utilities can. And you do side-by-side -side comparisons. And I'm willing to say if, you know, if, if, if the big system wins, fine. But at least look at it. Now, with distributed energy resources, you're a smart group. I'm impressed with the materials I saw, and, and you know what distributed energy resources are. But I talked to a lot of audiences who don't, so I came up with this kind of simple explanation of buy it, make it, eliminate it, store it, shift it, careful when you say that one publicly, uh, manage it, sell it, share it, reduce it because these are all matched then with technologies that are generically called distributed energy resources. The one that people are really focusing on a lot these days is energy storage because that's a technology that allows us to take intermittent wind and intermittent solar and store it for when the grid needs it or when somebody needs it. Um, that's a technology, as they say, that's been around for a while, but it also eventually will allow us to do dispatch it, another it. Uh, manage it, I'm gonna talk a little bit about microgrids later and uh, virtual power plants. I have a little trouble getting my head around that one sometimes. And, uh, and then uh, 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 demand response tools. But these are the technologies again that are out there. And I think quite frankly that even the utilities don't understand how to use these as a group. It's not about silos, it's not about one technology, it's all of them. How can we deploy all of these to better manage the system? And I think we're just now starting to understand that. Now the first step I think that's really key in this is something that's been called grid modernization or the smart grid. I don't like to always use that term smart grid because it implies that we have a dumb grid and we don't really have a dumb grid at all. But uh, smart grid is pretty simple in terms of understanding the difference between the existing grid. It's two-way power flows and two-way communication flows. So what that means is if you have uh, solar panels on your home or your barn um, or your business or your factory, <coughs> you can have two-way electron flow. Likewise, communication with all these new technologies of, of uh, uh, smart home management systems uh, that are starting to come into the marketplace, you need to have the communication lines fl that flowing as well two ways so that the grid can understand what's going on at your home. And one of the amazing things is I worked with a group of people who actually invented the original microgrid and are still working on microgrid technologies. The microgrid now actually is so smart, you can sense what the grid needs. It's almost kind of like a brain of its own. Does anyone remember the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey? Okay, where Hal took over the world? That just makes me a little nervous myself with a microgrid is that smart. Okay, so to some numbers, just quickly. State of Indiana had a group called the Advanced Energy Economy, it's an NGO, who looked at some of these technologies. And they looked at, I believe, just three of them here three different strategies and they modeled it and they found that the state of Indiana could save up to 2.3 billion dollars by deploying these technologies. So I ask you, 
who out there thinks under the current system your prices are going to go down next year or two years from now or five years from now or ten years from now? Anybody? Okay, I'll buy it. <laughs> but I think with these technologies is that we at least have the opportunity to bring prices down. Take some money to deploy some of them, but uh, we, we, we uh, should at least be studying and looking at this. Now here's a map of uh, about a year ago where states stood on energy storage. Once again, who's one of the states that had no projects at this time? I think we now have one, Wisconsin. It's kind of sad. So store it, I think, is kind of uh, where a, an exciting opportunity exists to bring this into the fold of managing these intermittent solar and wind power generation systems. But also with demand management, we have smart thermostats, uh, other types of technologies, and then finally electric vehicles, which will eventually be integrated into this as well. Just want to briefly talk about this as a project when we were working at the university, we had a, a, a paper that you can find at the Wisconsin Energy Institute about the dynamic distribution system, DDS, just like a dentist. And with microgrids, you can manage all this locally. And you really can have a small scale local energy system. So I think this is, again, the technology that needs to be integrated into the system. Our neighboring state of Illinois just passed legislation that now allows for uh, non-utility owned neighborhood microgrids. So if Illinois can do it, so can we. And, and finally, the technology that I think really can help us along with energy efficiency uh, that uh, uh, Melissa is going to talk a little bit more in depth is this demand flexibility or demand management where we can really start to bring down, uh, again, they're saying some early uh, studies have shown that costs com could come down 10 to 15 percent using just demand flexibility or demand management. And again, a report just came out this month where they modeled the current Texas grid system and the current Texas generation system and found that they could be saving up to 1.9 billion dollars. This is real money. <laughs> this is impressive. And finally, I just want to sort of end on a positive note here that I think what we need to do is form a new relationship with our utility. And this is, I really high, highly recommend you read this article uh, by William Boyd. It's a law journal article and I don't often recommend law journal articles because they can be a little academic, but it's very compelling. He makes the case that we have lost the public in our public utility. And it is not what the founders wanted. Uh, this concept actually comes from the Wisconsin progressive movement. And so I think we need to think about that our utilities need to realize that their customers are a partner in this. But we also have to realize though the utilities are a partner in this. I know some people have kind of a negative view of them. But that's because we need to get back to this concept of the public utility and that it's an instrument of the commonwealth. It is ours. It's our utility. So I, I hope you'll think about that. And I want to cut it short here because I know we're on a tight time frame. Happy to talk about any of this in the Q&A or later today. But thank you so much. <laughs>